Hello. I'm putting the headphones on. I've got to get my headphones in. All right. My speakers are blown in my uh, thing here. Brilliant. There oh, I am. <laughs> I was so excited to talk to you and tell you, and this is no joke, but at least once a week, I'm blasting. I'll be the one and sometimes off of uh, straight up. <laughs> so how are you doing where are you you're in you're in minneapolis yeah i'm in hopkins which is a suburb of minneapolis yeah yeah is the audio bad am i breaking up and everything is everything, no you're perfect is everything okay on your end oh my I goodness mean, it's perfect oh, okay good good i was i was gonna ask you joey you know why why good. the most northern point of the of the u.s is it because you're from liverpool and you wanted to be up north <laughs> no, nothing. I uh, when I first came to America in 1970, I met a girl, and she was from this town. And uh, Kathy Wiggins, her name was, and I married her. And we uh, years later, of course, we had a couple of kids, and uh, we came back to Minnesota uh, to raise our children around Kathy's family. My family, of course, is in Liverpool, and uh, so I've lived here really ever since. Uh, um, we moved here permanently about 1983, something like that. Um, yeah, and we've raised our kids in. They're all grown up now, big, healthy American boys, I'm happy to say. And, and, and Minnesotans. There's, a, there's, there's certain, you know... Uh, yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> they, they do say that they are very nice up there. And they do say that. Yes. <laughs> you have to, but they, and I suppose they're as nice as anywhere else, you know, but... I would imagine. <laughs> what I wanted to ask you, and before we get into the new record as well, you know, I, I've always been fascinated with anyone who grew up in Liverpool after World War II. Was there still a black market when you were like 10 years old in the, in the 50s? Well, things fell off lorries uh, regularly, you know. <laughs> but uh, if you know what I mean, they fell out of the back of trucks and stuff. So I imagine there was, but, you know, who knows about that stuff at 10 years old? I was... Uh, a very regular kid, working class, playing soccer, uh, footy, we used to call it, playing ollies in the gutters, making bows and arrows and spears and all the regular stuff. So I didn't know about the black market. I'm sure it was prevalent. I know there was, uh, my father told me there was a, 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 later on, of course, that there was a huge uh, drug traffic uh, down in the South End of the city underground tunnels and stuff. I'm mean, talking about hard drugs, you know, opium, uh, heroin and all that. So all that was going on. I know that there was a, a great music scene at the time. Uh, and actually, to come forward to the Bad Finger days, uh, the manager of the band was a guy named Bill Collins. He was our personal manager, not the crook, okay. uh, our personal guy. And he, he, was, he was a piano player in Liverpool, involved in the jazz scene. He met Paul McCartney's dad, who played trumpet, apparently, in that scene. And they become acquaintances, not, not so much friends, but acquaintances. And, of course, when it came to Apple Records and the Ivies and Badfinger and all that stuff, Bill Collins used that very slight connection uh, to get into Abbey Road, to meet the Beatles and shop the band to them, uh, to sign to the new label. So it all, it all kind of rolls around, doesn't it? <laughs> That's funny. But yeah, Liverpool uh, came That's... out of the Second War, Second World War, all blown to hell, uh, bombed, you know. And uh, We used to play in the bomb sites and the old army dumps there uh, in the parks and stuff, uh, finding gas masks and things. You know, it, was, it was kind of cool, cool thing to do. Yeah, no, I, I, that's, you know, being so far away from all that stuff, and I studied in England, and, you know, you see a lot of, you know, monuments and you, you walk the streets and think, you know, wow, these, these docklands on the east end of London were just bombed to hell. And then I know that, like, Birkenhead up near you. And um, was your father in the war? Was your yeah, dad he was in, in the army. Yeah. yeah, my dad served. Did he talk about it? He didn't talk a lot about it, though. You know, my uncles either, because my uncles were in the war, too. Uh, his brother's. So when you when you met the guys in the Ivies, you know, is, I always think about, you know, I asked you about geography and, you know, you being in, in Minnesota and being from Liverpool. Did, did Liverpoolians get on well with uh, Welsh guys? Was there, was there any kind of uh, culture clash or did the music sort of bring you guys all together? 
No, 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 no I think by that, by that generation, um, at least in my experience, there wasn't really any weirdness between the two. You know, the history is checkered between England and Wales, you know, as we see from Vikings and all that stuff. Okay. Uh, but uh, no, there wasn't really anything about that. Uh, I knew uh, Spencer Davis and uh, the Spencer Davis band, and uh, the, the, when I met the Welsh musicians, actually through the Ivies, I met a lot of guys from Swansea. Uh, and Swansea is one of the uh, kind of rock and roll hubs in Wales, if you like. Great, great people coming from there, a lot of great bands, the Man Band, uh, the Ivies, of course, were a great band out of Swansea. Uh, rhythm and blues and rock and roll, I might add. Uh, uh, it was the kind of band they were, and uh, they were they were well respected in the area. So, but no, no, there was no no animosity between them as far as cultures go. You know what I mean? I'm sure underneath them, because the Welsh are a very proud nation, as are the English. You and know, so singers. so those things would, would would come up a little bit. But yeah, oh, the Welsh were great singers. My goodness. Yeah. <laughs> oh, is, did you, Look at Pete. My God, could he sing? Did you ever? Did you ever watch uh, Black Adder? Yeah, 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 yeah. Just the lines about about the well. Rowan Atkinson. Yeah. Yes. He, he said you got to clean the phlegm out of your hair if you're down in Wales because of because of the singing. <laughs> so, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. That's great. So what? You know, I. <laughs> There's so many great lines in all of that stuff. What, um, you know, how prevalent, you know, you mentioned Paul McCartney yeah. in, in your, you're about five to six years younger than these guys, but how aware of them were you? Were they from the same area of Liverpool? Did you go to the cavern to see them? Well, Liverpool, Liverpool wasn't that, is not big a city. Uh, I think the, the population was only like 375,000 when I was growing up. Uh, I did see the Beatles at the cabin once in the very early 60s. I was maybe 13, 14 at the time. You could go to the cabin. There was no drink in there. You know, it was, it, it was, a, uh, it was just a club. Uh, and they served soup and, and tea and coffee and uh, Pepsi Cola. And so it, it was great. I was I was playing truant from school uh, quite a lot in those days. Uh, started going to films and uh, finding out about Indian food, Chinese food, and all that. And uh, one of the things I found out about was the cabin. And of course, I went there and I happened to see the Beatles there. Uh, who I thought I thought they were very very good. I started to go quite often to see the the other bands that were on, and uh, it was mostly in the lunchtime. Uh, sessions because uh, I was I was doing it while I was you know playing through and sagging school we called it so yeah it, uh, it was great they were a great little band they scared you as far as wanting to get in a band yourself I'd started playing the guitar when I was eleven and uh, by by you know by that time I had a couple of years in it I knew me some of me Buddy Ollie some of me Chuck Berry mm -hmm. and uh, so I wanted to play with other players but they were so good. And I'm not talking about just the Beatles, just generally across uh, those bands, the big three, uh, uh, the Mojos. They were called the Nomads then, the, Nom the Mojos. And, uh, you know, people like that, uh, they, they were great players. And, and like I say, it scared you, you know what I mean, as a kid, to think you would ever be that good, you know? Uh, so that was good. It was exciting, man. It was really exciting. Liverpool... Is a great place. It still is a great place to grow up. The people are fantastic there. It's like we're a big family. You know, that's how I felt. These are all my, my family. You know, the people in Liverpool were great. You know? I noticed when I, when, I was, I, when I went to school in London, I thought people were so unfriendly. And every time I went up north, whether it was Manchester and then um, you know, even I even went to Blackpool, like everyone was so nice. I was thinking, I, I don't want to go back to London because people actually talk to you here. But, you know, Liverpool, like you mentioned, you know, you were getting acquainted. Well, I think, you know, London was a, um, London's such a huge uh, city. You know, there were, I don't know, 12 million people living there when I, when I went to live there in, in the late 60s. And uh, I think 
you know, our, our impression of London is formed by living in, in that downtown kind of inside the loop kind of areas of yeah. London. But if you go to the neighborhoods of London, you know, the regular working class neighborhoods, they're just like us. They, they, they were the same, you know what I mean? So, you know, I used to feel like that about London myself. But over the years, of course, I've got to know, you know, people like Jerry Shirley, uh, you know, Umbo Pie Drummer and all that. The Who, I got to know The Who as well. Did a load, load of gigs with them in the, in the mid-60s, kind of my generation era. They, they were like normal blokes. They were crazy. I mean, I mean, you know, everybody knows that. But, but it was uh, just normal people. I, I didn't find that. Living in London during those few years, and I, I, I won't go on too long about this, but that downtown area, you, yeah, you don't get to meet anybody. You don't make friends in central London, you know? All your friends come from the outsides of London, from the East End, you know, uh, just from different areas, from South London. You know what I mean? What about Joe Brown? <laughs> yeah, Joe Brown and the brothers was his name of his man. <laughs> He's a nice bloke. I did meet Joe Brown, yeah. Yeah. He gave me, and he gave Tommy and I a lift home to Liverpool once from Blackpool. What do you think? But are, are you nostalgic for those times? Because you seem very present. You're always working. You're always trying to make new music. And yet, you know, uh, and, that's, and that's a good thing. It keeps you young. How, explain to me how the latest project came about and how you enlisted all these other you know, notable people like Mark Hudson and, and Julian. And could you tell me about that? Sure. Uh, um, I've met Mark, you know, like you say, I work a lot. You know, I do a lot of gigs and do Beatle Fests and things like that. And sure enough, Mark had been doing all the gigs with Ringo and, you know, producing his records. And so naturally I met him at those shows. And we got to be friends. He always wanted to get up and sing the bad finger songs with me. Uh, he liked to sing the harmonies, the high harmonies. So we got to be good friends over those years. Uh, and I guess I've known him maybe 12 years, 15 years. And so we got to be good friends. And, and I talked about making records. And, you know, it'd be great to work with a great producer, <laughs> hint, hint. And, uh, you know, so... Uh, after a while, about five years ago, we started to talk about actually making a record. And it came about, I sent Mark about I don't know, 35, 40 songs, and he listened to them. Uh, he liked them, he liked a lot of them. And so he picked out uh, 10 or 12 of the songs. I can't remember quite how many, but we started working on the songs, you know? And Mark started doing his, uh, his production. Uh, ideas, bringing in a chorus here and there, you know, talking to me about the lyrics, the arrangements and all the rest of it, and which is exactly what you want a producer to do, and great ideas, and you know, it all is, it all is precluded, or, or, or if that's the word, uh, by both of our fascination uh, marks, mostly with the Beatles. He's a, he's a tremendous Beatles fan, as we all are. Uh, and of course, making my record, I gave him free reign to be, to be that. I didn't try and control him in any way at all. So we, we enjoyed working together. Um, the songs he picked, I thought, were great. Gary Bear was nice enough to send us a, the idea for the Rainy Day Man song. Mm -hmm. And Mark and I immediately sat down and finished that up and wrote the rest of the words and put a bridge in it and stuff like that. It worked out. I think the, the record worked out really pretty nice. I think we did a pretty good job. My voice held up really well. Mark really was into recruiting the singers, although Jason Sheff uh, uh, become a great friend of mine because I toured with him. And Mickey Dolan too. We'd become great friends. And Mark is a, he's like a raconteur. You know, he, he, you know, he gets about the business. He meets everybody. He, he, you know, he loves musicians, singers, songwriters. He loves talented people. And he makes a point of staying in touch with them. He knew Julian. I'd met Julian briefly when Balot was out. Uh, so, so we had a, a slight acquaintance. And apparently, you know, he was a big a Bad Finger fan. Uh, you know, as everybody is. <laughs> sorry, sorry if I'm shouting that out there. But <laughs> it's, uh, it's just a fact of the matter. It's, it's, it's great. <laughs> you, you mentioned Balot. I mean, this is... This, oh. It's so good. Hudson's got the great, he always dyes his beard, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it does, yeah, he does. Yeah, Jason Sheff, is, <laughs> is his father Jerry Sheff, the bass player who played with Elvis? Yes, he is. 
Boy, I was excited when I found that out, man. I was really excited about that. I would imagine that Julian Lennon probably enjoys hearing about Liverpool just from a guy who grew up there, as opposed to just somebody who wants to talk about his dad. Yeah, you know, I've never talked to him about his dad. Uh, I never I never bring his dad up. I'm, I'm sure he's fed up with that. But I don't know, you know, when your dad's John Lennon, I don't know what it feels like to talk about him because he is John Lennon after all, you know what I mean? <laughs> but Julian's a lovely man. Uh, we talk about general things when, when, when we're together. Uh, talk about the songs, talk about the music. He volunteers his ideas. Uh, uh, he's a lovely man, just a really nice guy. You know, what are you going to do? He's got his own career, his own life. You know, I've never seen him freak out about anything. Uh, he, he, you know, he's, he's always been cool when I've been around him or he's been around me. Or, sure. It's all been good. When I was looking at uh, the press release that Kerry Baker sent me, who I love, he's such a good guy. You know, the, there's so much myth surrounding Badfinger. Are there any... Do you ever uh, say, well, it didn't exactly happen like that, and it's not such a horrible thing? Obviously, the the, the death of Pete and, and things a bit. Do you have a different? Obviously, you have a different vantage because you were in the band and you've thought about things. And has his time given you a clearer vision of the past? <laughs> yeah, you know, I felt that I always did have a clear vision, although I've never really paid too much attention to the business side of it. I was just in the band. Uh, I wrote me songs. I got on with the guys, went out for a drink. You know, we did all the things that bands do together. You know, we were in our early 20s. Uh, we were living the, living the life, enjoying ourselves, buying guitars, doing all the normal things. We got excited when we got a new band van, you know, when we got, uh, we, we went from having a Ford uh, to having a Mercedes van, you know, <laughs> it was great. We had, a, we, you know, we all lived together. We, we watched our Monty Python together. We did, uh, went to the movies, uh, you know, your Clint Eastwood movies. We we rented a castle to rehearse in. Uh, we had the time of our lives in that band, and we were working with the Beatles for crying out loud. We met a lot of people, especially in America, uh, when we came here on tour. No, I really enjoyed myself in Bad Thing, and I never, ever look at it as a downer. I, I really don't, even though we lost everything we made. I was destitute in 1974, the end of 1974, you know, after four top ten hits, after, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of sold-out concerts uh, with ASCAP royalties up the, up the yin-yang, checks from Apple Records, for a quarter of a million pound coming in. That size checks. Uh, we made a bloody fortune, but at the end of 1974, I had no guitars except my first guitar, uh, my firebird that I still have, and uh, I had $700. That's what I had, 700 bucks. Uh, that's the only bad thing about it. Uh, the manager was a crook, the American guy, Stan Polly, he was a crook, and I'm glad he's dead. Mm -hmm. um, I hope he's paying for it now. A lot of the other people around us, I feel the same way about. I have no love, I'm sorry to say, for a lot of the uh, bad things that were immediately surrounding, bad, uh, surrounding the band because they all kind of, I don't know, had these weird illusions about what was going on in the band. And they all talk about it like they were in the band. And so I've got those, th those things in my head. And, and, you know, there I've said that now. I'm just sick of it. I really am sick of it. I'm so sick of it that I really don't want to be associated with it in that way, right. in that sense. I don't want to be associated with the depressing story of Badfinger, uh, the tragedy of Badfinger. You know, hey, I don't know why those guys did what they did. I don't know. I went through the exact same experience, you know, in terms of the band, in terms of writing the songs, in terms of doing the work, and in, in terms of ending up with nothing, you know? I don't know what happened. I really don't know. I can't tell you why Tommy did what he did or Pete did what he did. I know Mike didn't do it and I didn't do it. You know, and Bill Collins didn't do it either. Mm -hmm. I mean, Bill, Bill Collins invested his, his entire life's earnings and work in that band. You know, he, he cashed out his life insurance policy to pay 
the, the rent and to pay the bills and to get the guys a drink now and again or whatever, to buy the van for the band. You know, he really did put himself in there, but he never went out and hung himself when it all went to shit, you know? I don't know. I don't really know what happened there. And I don't want to be really associated with it, you know? I don't blame you, but that says a lot about you because in the end, what's the best legacy? It's the music. And it's, it's what... It's what you're known for. It's what people think of when they think of the band. I appreciate you saying that because that's one of, uh, you know, we live in such a weird time right now where people are really choosing to be so broken and so negative, whereas, yeah, it's not the best. It's not optimal, but people are going out and, and they're still making music the way they can, even if there's COVID. So what? What's the secret to living a good life, even if you've been through something so horrible like that? I think it's I think it's that simple. I think you've got to live a good life. You live a bad life, it's going to come back and haunt you. It's going to do something. You know, I don't I don't know, but uh, that's you know I live day to day. I don't really live for the future. I sang that in one of my songs in the past, and when I hear it, I go, Why did I say that? Because I don't know what the future is. I've got no idea. But I know if I get up today and go to work, at the end of the day, I'll be tired. I'll feel good because I did that all my life. Yeah. I started work when I was 15 and I'm still working now. I'm 73 years old. You know, I'm still working. And uh, that's all I've ever done is get a job. Get a job. If, a, if when I was young and I was playing the guitar and doing all that, if a job came up in a band, I went for it. I, if I wanted to be in that band, I went and knocked on the door. I went for the Moody Blues job when Denny Lane left. Uh, you know, really, I, I went for the uh, for the Rolling Stones job uh, when Mick Taylor left. Uh, it was really weird, that, isn't it? <laughs> but, you know, you, I don't know. You've got to go for the job. And if you get it, you get it. If you don't, you've got to go for the next job. You know what I mean? All I wanted to do in those days was play the guitar and, uh, and work, really. And I would work as hard as I can. When I joined Badfinger, uh, I'd already written, like, uh, uh, you know, half of my first album, you know? I'd already written some hits. In J they were hits in Japan, no and nevertheless. And uh, or I say they were hits only because I've been told they were hits. I've never really confirmed that. But I had the experience of writing songs. I'd been singing for about... Ooh, eight years, six or eight years in a band in Liverpool and in several other bands. I'd done me at theatre tours. Uh, I was in back the backup band for the Merseys, all of that stuff. So I had a lot of experience. And this all comes from going and getting jobs. You know what I mean? It's funny because when I saw the players uh, uh, in Liverpool, when I saw the bands playing, the Mojos, or the Beatles, uh, the Searchers, all these bands, the big three. I never thought I'd be good enough to play in a band. You know, I had no dreams about making records. You know, who thought about that? You know, you know, Andrew Lou Oldham came up to a band I was in, in like 1965, 66, uh, called the Masterminds in Liverpool. And he heard us do a Bob Dylan song. Now this is Andrew Oldham, the manager of the Rolling Stones, yeah? Mm -hmm. And he came up to our band in a club in Liverpool and said, that was great, man. You guys want to come to London and make a record? And that's how I started making records. That's how we started making records. He came up and said to us, we weren't really thinking about going to London and making records. We just liked to play. We loved to play our Chuck Berry. And we found the Bob Dylan through our roadie, the Bob Dylan fan. And uh, so we picked up one of his songs and that was our... That was our kind of key to the door into the recording world. So anyway, you know, I love it. Just I, go to work. You want to live a good life? Get up and go to work. Don't feel bad for yourself. Just get up and go to work. You know, you know, I worked as an office boy running around ships on the docks and picking up mail and uh, doing that. And then I got a job working in a factory packaging mail order stuff, you know, making parcels. I just, I had to work. I had to go to work. I gave the money to my man. And, uh, you know, the, my mom and my dad gave me that back. You know, they gave, uh, 
They gave me everything that I am, really. They, they gave me my strength. They gave me my health. They gave me my uh, belief. They gave me my faith. They encouraged my music. Uh, they loved the idea that I played the guitar. They really encouraged it, you know? They didn't mind me dreaming, but they, but they advised me not to dream. You know, I had a really good upbringing. I had five brothers. Your family is everything. Your family is everything. And, and they all feel the same way about you in a real family. You are everything to them, you know? And they're everything to you. They are, you'll do anything for your brother or your, or your sister or your mom or your dad, you know, or your uncles or your aunties, whatever. Yeah. They're all, they're all, you know, it's all it. It's all this, it's all this, you know? So you learn that, don't you? You learn to love people. You know, you learn to look at the good things. You believe in people, you know? I'm sure you've instilled that in your, in your own children. I, I, I assured my children as much as I possibly could that I was their dad and I was their dad. And that was the end of that. You know what I mean? They don't need to even think about that. Right. You know? And I don't think about them. You know, I, I really, I mean, I think about them all the time. I live with my eldest son. You know, he's looking after me now. He's looking after me now. You know what I mean? So, uh, and we have a great time together. We, we, you know, we do stuff. We go out concerts and all the rest of it. We, we used to go bowling when we were kids. Uh, wow. uh, they were great. They were great sports guys. Uh, superb uh, baseball players. Football, not so much, but they, but they were really good at it. They just didn't have the, uh, the fancy for it. Yeah, I've, I've, I've had a really good life, man. I, I, thank God. Uh, my wife was, was fabulous. Kathy uh, Wiggins loved Badfinger, would have died for Badfinger. And those people uh, who were around the band say really terrible things about it. Mm -hmm. and, and Kathy was the strongest one of all of them. All of them, you know? She had that American, no, you know, no limits uh, to her ambition. And if she saw something, she said it, you know what I mean? And people, are, uh, people in England are very diplomatic, you know, they're all very, oh, you can't do that, you can't do this. Well, she wasn't like that, you know? So I fell in love with her right away. Well, music's like God's gift to us, isn't it? You know, it's one of the great gifts we have. And we all have it. We all walk down the street singing. We walk around doing it. We whistle. We've done it since the dawn of man. You know what I mean? We beat on things. Like we painted on cave walls, you know? We, th these are gifts that we're given. And uh, yeah, I, I get endless joy from music. Uh, I buy records still, I buy old records, uh, and I buy new copies of old records, Delaney and Bonnie Live, you know, uh, things like that, you know, uh, Right Place, Wrong Time, you know, Dr. John and all that, the Allman Brothers. And you know, these things are magnificent achievements. There's nothing like it. Ari Nielsen, you know, my God, all the way from first album to the last album. You know, it, these are geniuses who work amongst us. Uh, and it's fantastic. I get nervous around the great musos. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're so powerful. They're so powerful. It, bloody incredible. Incredible. <laughs> I mean, we, we should all feel like you obviously do about music. Nielsen Schmielsen is my favorite. <laughs> yeah, Nielsen Schmielsen, that's great. <laughs> when, you, when you first came to the U.S., that must have just blown you away. Do you have any, you know, your, any great first impressions of any of the first shows? Yeah, yeah, we played up in the first show we did in America proper. We, we'd been to Hawaii to play the Beatle Convention, the Apple Convention, or the, the actually EMI, Capitol Records Convention. But we didn't count that as coming to America. We came to America and we landed in Minneapolis and went to Fargo, North Dakota. And uh, we played at the field house for the college up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how do you forget that? How could you forget that? The next day we came to Minneapolis. I had a day off, I went out. I met my, the girl who would be my wife uh, in Minneapolis that day. We played in St. Catherine's Hall. It, it, it was fantastic, the place was sold out. And we started playing to sell outs. You know, we played every kind of gig. We played town halls, city halls, armories, high school gyms, field houses, university, you know, gigs, big gigs. Uh, we played stadiums. We played tiny little clubs in New York City. In New York City, the Hells Angels came to see us. 
and they 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 left a few a few of the angels with us to look after us. Oh, wow. Really, everywhere we went in the city, there were three or four Hell's Angels walking around with us, you know, so talking to us about the area and making sure that nobody gave us any shtick, you know what I mean? It was really cool, man. People, people really took care of us. The people, people were sweet. Uh, they were friendly. We went out after the gigs. We didn't know anybody in America, obviously. There were the four of us on two roadies. Our manager was with us, uh, you know, most of the time, Bill Collins, I mean, a personal guy. And we drive around in, in, a, in a car first, and then we got a, a Delmonico bus out of New York. We had an ex-policeman driving it, uh, Walter. He was a black guy, African-American, I suppose. And uh, he had a little blaster on the front, and he'd always be playing, like, Stax records and, you know, stuff like that. Real, real good R&B, which we do. We, we were from Liverpool, I was. And I grew up listening to that stuff, you know what I mean? Learning, you know, uh, Steve Cropper's guitar licks and stuff, you know. So it, we had a, it was fantastic, like a little fantasy world, this little, little band travelling around, selling places out, you know. But America was incredible. The, the cars, the clothes, the, the swagger in, in, in the men the confidence that everybody seemed to exude. You know, we were raised as, as, you know, we were the working class and we were never going to be the upper class. We were never going to be, uh, even the middle class was a huge dream. To own your own home was a huge dream, you know. And most people didn't in England until they started selling the government housing. Right. You know, they never, you never used to be able to buy a council house. You could only rent them. But anyway, that was the atmosphere we'd grown up in, in England. You certainly weren't expected to go to university. You know, you weren't. You know, uh, uh, you were expected to finish your high school. Uh, so America was this completely different place, completely different idea. You know, colour TV everywhere, uh, FM stations, stereo everywhere, all different ones, all playing different music, you know? Uh, the DJs were wild and crazy. They weren't conservative, or, 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 you know, or upper, or, or upper class, uh, you know, DJs. You know what I mean? It was, it was a different world, man, you know. So we, again, we were astounded. Uh, my dad had always loved America. I and mean, he, 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 if I ever got the chance to go there, you know, he loved it. You know, he met a lot of Americans in the war and a lot of Americans came through Liverpool. Sure. You know, Liverpool was a big uh, embarkation point for uh, for Americans coming to England uh, during that period. And there were American bases around Liverpool and stuff. They would see the cars. My dad was a mechanic uh, downtown. I would service the cars, the, uh, you know, the Cadillacs and stuff that came up, to, uh, the Chevys and things like that. I learned a lot of that stuff. Uh, learned to service my own cars. When I came to America, I bought a Chevy Blazer. And uh, the first thing I, I did was go to the store and buy the book about it so that I could, I could do it, you know. I learned how to do all that stuff. I really enjoy it, really enjoy that. I came here in 1975. It was 1985 before I got any money. Mm. You know, I just, uh, uh, I eked my way through. I got a job as a carpenter. I got a job as a carpet installer. I did some bad finger jobs with, with, with Tommy. Uh, Tommy came over, but we made very little money, very little money all those years. You look, go look back and look at my tax record, you'll see what I made, man. There's like a bunch of zero years, you know what I mean? Yeah, it sucked. We got no ASCAP money. Uh, that's something I'll talk about in my book. What, what are some of your favorite, favorite songs, like the, the overall production? Just tell me about the new album. I think this time uh, is a, is a, was a great little number. Love the uh, original uh, Better to, Better Tomorrow. The Rainy Day Manicost was a wonderful idea, uh, as I say, given to us by Gary Fair. Loving You, I think, is a really dynamite little number. Uh, I love, you know, I, you know, there aren't any of them that I don't really love. Yesterday, I had for years and years and years as a melody. I couldn't do the lyric, and then one night, I had a conversation with my eldest brother, Frank, this was about seven or eight, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, we sat in his kitchen and had a, had a beer and just rabbited about stuff. And 
I got the lyrics from, from all the stuff we talked about that night. That's what it was yesterday. We talked about the future. Uh, can we make it better? You know the way you, the way you do. Uh, it was the first real chance or real conversation I'd had with Frank. Uh, even though I'd known him and loved him all my life, he was so much older than me. You know what I mean? Because he was, when I was born, I think Frank was 16, 17. You know, so, I mean, he knew me as a baby. You know what I mean? So, you know. Does, does hard work remedy? Hard work, I'll tell you now, gets your mind off everything. You know, if you're working, you can't be, you can't be thinking about other things while you're working. You know, that, you know if, you're, if you're hanging a door, you can't be thinking about something else while you're, while you're doing that. You know what I mean? It's true. It's, it's, it's so true. And the times I've done that and let myself be distracted, I've broken it. You know what I mean? Uh, I've screwed up. It's like if I'm playing the guitar, especially live, this is. If I'm playing the guitar and I see something that distracts me, I'll more than likely screw up the guitar part. You see the great artists performing, you can see how totally focused they are, you know, in the music, in the music, actors in the moment, you know what I mean? In the moment, when they're not, then the, the acting's gone, isn't it? You know, so, so yeah, working will take your mind off anything, anything at all. My wife passed away on uh, March uh, March 14th is what I think it is. My kids think it was March 24th and neither of us will go back. But I got over that by going, I was, I had gigs booked. Two weeks later, I was going on the road and I went out on the road and stayed on the road. And I worked my way through that loneliness and that grief and the quietness of the house, the sadness of it. My children did the same, you know? I didn't take my mind off, Kathy, uh, of course, it, it doesn't take, you know, you don't forget things like that, but it, 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 you can deal with everything in, in some kind of real terms, you know, and you do have to function when you work. You, you can't let things distract you. You just can't, you know? It's devastating. Right out of the blue. Right out of the blue. No warning, no doctor's report coming in, you know, no suffering uh, through through an illness for, for a couple of years as well and sharing. Just right out of the blue, we sat up talking till three in the morning. The next morning she was gone. You know, I actually went and made her a cup of tea in the morning, you know, so. I'm so sorry. You know, you deal with these things the way you deal with them. I went to work, you know. You know so. Kathy had a very deep love for people. You know, uh, she was devastated when Pete, Pete died. I mean, absolutely devastated. Man, you know, thank God for Joe Smith at Warner's getting in touch with us and asking, were we okay? And then um, uh, getting the tickets for us to come to England to go to Pete's funeral. Because we, we didn't have any money to do it. You know, so there were, uh, you know, that's incredible, that, isn't it? People, you know, so, you know, come along and do things like that for you help you, you know what I mean? And they show you that kindness that we're all capable of. This, is, this has been a real honor for me. Have a great weekend. I'm a big fan of yours. Thank you, man. I've, enjoyed, right. the, I've enjoyed the interview. You too. Me uh, too. And I want to tap your brain about promoting a record. How do, how do I promote a record, you know? How do I do that? <laughs> well, that's, 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 I'm that's, doing my, my level best. Uh, let's figure it out. <laughs> you know, there's only so much publicity to do. But you know, it's you have a secret though that most young people probably don't have, and that's kind of perseverance. Attention spans are so short these days because these millennials just want everything now, now, now. Well, they've been given everything now, now, now. Right. <laughs> thanks so much, Steve. Thanks for helping with my record. Oh. Even if thanks for even caring about the record. It's great. I love I'm, it. I'm thrilled. Okay. God bless.